Okay, we're back on the record this morning on case CR 22-21-1624, State v. Lori Noreen Vallow. This is the time scheduled for continuing jury trial. State's in its case in chief when we broke yesterday. I'll note that the prosecution is here present. The defense and defendant also are in attendance. This proceeding is being held here in this courtroom, of course, subject to a conduct order that prohibits the use of any electronic devices from recording or photographing any images or transmitting them from the courtroom. In addition, in the locations where this trial is being simulcast in both Ada and Madison counties, the administrative order also prevents the use of devices for that reason as well, so they're not permitted to be used to record or photograph or transmit any sounds from the trial and the proceedings. So the court appreciates everyone complying with those courtroom orders. The court's also been advised the jurors are all here and have signed their affirmations, and so I understand the state would have another witness to call at this time. Is the state going to be prepared with the next witness? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Why don't we have the jury brought in then, and then you can call your next witness. All right, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All 
All right, as mentioned by the bailiff, the court would note all the jurors are here in attendance, properly seated, and they've also filled out their affirmations for the day. I appreciate you being able to do that and continuing to follow the court's admonition. I'd ask the state at this time to call their next witness. The state calls Ray Hermosillo. All right, sir, if you'd come forward and just pause in the middle of the gallery here, I'll have you placed under oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All right. Thank you. All right, thank you, officer. While you're being questioned, please remember we're keeping a record, so make verbal responses and try to avoid talking at the same time as anyone questioning you. With that in mind, Mr. Wood, you can inquire. Thank you. Can you state your name for the record and then spell your last name? Ray Hermosillo, H-E-R-M-O-S-I-L-L-O. Thank you. What is your occupation? I'm a detective with the Rexburg Police Department. Is detective your rank? It is. Okay. Are you post-certified? I am. I have 22 years in law enforcement and 2,100 hours of training through post and currently hold an advanced certificate through the Post Academy. Okay. How long have you been a detective? Oh, four years now. Okay. And what other responsibilities have you held before you were a detective? I was a patrolman and a patrol supervisor. Okay. Have you worked for any law enforcement agency other than the Rexburg Police Department? No, sir. Okay. And you may have said this already. I apologize. How long have you been with the Rexburg Police Department? 22 years. Okay. Have you been involved in the investigation regarding J.J. Vallow, Tylee Ryan, and Tammy Daybell? I have. Okay. How did you become involved in that investigation? On November 1st, I was contacted initially by Fremont County. I was advised that there was a Jeep in our jurisdiction that was possibly involved in an attempted homicide. And at that time, I contacted Gilbert Police to inquire what they needed us to do in reference to that. Okay. And what did you do in response to your conversation with Gilbert Police? Once I obtained some information from Gilbert, they asked us to seize the Jeep if we had located it. They also asked us to perform intermittent surveillance on the residents. And so at that time, that's exactly what we did. We performed intermittent surveillance until we located the Jeep. Okay. Can you describe what you saw during your intermittent surveillance? We had taken some photographs of Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow walking into the residence, but we were unable to locate the Jeep at that time. When you say residence, where are you referring to? 565 Pioneer, number 175. Okay. During your surveillance, did you ever see a teenage girl with Lori Vallow? No, we did not. During your surveillance, did you ever see a young boy with Lori Vallow? No, we did not. Okay. At the time you were doing the surveillance, were you aware of who J.J. Vallow was? Not at the time during the surveillance, no. Okay. Were you aware of who Tylee Ryan was? No. So is it fair to say at that time you weren't looking for children? That's correct. Okay. Detective, when was the first time you heard of J.J. Vallow? 
Gilbert police uh, came down to Rexburg. Let me back up. We were able to seize the Jeep on November 4th from that residence. Um, at that time, Gilbert police was advised and they came up to Rexburg on November 18th, 2019. At that time, they came up to serve a warrant on the infotainment center inside of that Jeep for GPS locations, things like that. When they came up, that's the first time we heard of Tylee Ryan or J.J. Bellow. So November 18th, 2019. Okay. And at that time, were you told that they were missing? We weren't told they were missing. We were told that their grandmother, uh, Kay Woodcock, was concerned that she hadn't spoken with J.J. for a while. Um, and they just asked us to keep an eye out at the residence. They said they were going to do some checking down in Arizona to see if JJ was possibly with friends down there. And if they needed us further, they would get with us at a later date. Okay. Did they get with you at a later date? They did. When was that? November 25th, <clears throat> 2019. I received a call from Detective Ryan Piller. Ryan advised that they were unable to locate JJ in Arizona and that he was in contact with JJ's grandma and she wanted a welfare check. So at that point, we told Detective Piller we would do a welfare check the next morning. Okay. And you said that was November 25th, correct? Correct. So what did you do in response to that request from Detective Pillar? The next morning, November 26, 2019, myself and Detective Dave Hope went to 565 Pioneer, 175, which was Lori Bellow's residence. Um, as we pulled up behind the residence, there's a garage area on the west side. Outside the garage area, we had located Alex Cox and Chad Daybell, who were unloading a pickup truck. Okay. Did you speak with Alex Cox or Chad Daybell that day? We did. Uh, how did that conversation go? I walked up to Alex and I asked Alex if Lori was home. Uh, he told me she wasn't home. I then asked Alex if he knew where JJ was at. We were there to do a welfare check on JJ. Um, at that point, Alex got a blank look on his face, kind of a, a frightened look, looked over at Chad Daybell, who was on the other side of the pickup truck. Chad then looked at Alex, um, and they both kind of just looked at each other and, and didn't answer my question initially. Okay. Uh, what did you think about that conduct? Uh, it raised some red flags just based on their the way they acted with that question. Um, I, I then again asked Alex if he knew where J.J. was at, and he stated that J.J. was with Kay in Louisiana. What did you think of that response? I told Alex that wasn't likely because Kay was the one who called in for the welfare check. Um, and then again, they both kind of just looked at each other, which again raised our suspicions. Did you speak with Chad Daybell at that time? I personally didn't speak to Chad at that time, no. Okay. What did you do next? I asked Alex if there was a way I can get a hold of Lori. Uh, he stated she wasn't home. I asked Alex where I could find Lori, and he stated that she was in apartment 107 in the same complex, just a different apartment. That time I asked Alex if he had Lori's phone number, and he stated he didn't have it. What did you think when he stated he didn't have her phone number? I assumed he was lying because they were close, and based on our investigation thus far with Gilbert 
we knew they were close. Um, so I assumed he was lying to me about the not having his sister's phone number. Okay. What did you do next? At that time, myself and Detective Dave Hope went back to apartment 107 in hopes to make contact with Lori. Uh, we knocked on the door at 107, and there was no answer. Okay. So you weren't able to make contact with anyone there? Correct. Okay. What happened after that? <clears throat> Once we weren't able to make contact, Detective Hope began knocking on apartment doors next to 107. Um, I started walking back to my car because I was going to call for more people to come to our location and start knocking on doors. Um, and at that time when I was walking back to my car, I saw Chad Daybell driving towards me in his black Chevy Equinox. Um, so he had just left 175 and was headed our direction. And at that time, I stopped him in the alleyway. And did you speak with him? I did. What did you ask him? I asked Chad when was the last time he saw JJ. And Chad told me it was in October in apartment 107 with Lori Vallow. Okay. Did you ask him anything else? I did. I asked him how... He knew Lori Vallow, and he stated that he hardly met her, hardly knew her, that he had only met her a couple of times. Okay. Uh, what did you think about that response? Sustained. <clears throat> okay. Was there anything suspicious to you about that response? There was. What was that? We knew that... Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell had been married two weeks prior to my contact with him. Okay. But he said he hardly knew her. That's correct. Okay. Uh, did you ask Chad Daybell anything else? I did. I asked Chad for her phone number, um, and he stated that he didn't know what it was. Okay. What happened after that? While I was speaking with Chad Daybell, uh, Detective Hope saw me talking with him, stopped knocking on doors, and started back to where I was talking with him. As Detective Hope showed up, uh, I again asked Chad Daybell for Lori's phone number because I didn't believe that he did not know it. Um, and at that time, he finally gave me Lori's phone number. Did he give you a reason why he hadn't given it originally? He said that he felt like I was accusing him of something, and that's why he didn't give it to me. Okay. What did you do at this point in your investigation? I broke contact with Mr. Daybell. He was able to drive off, um, and at that point I called Lieutenant Ron Ball, and, and I told him that there was something going on with the whereabouts of J.J. based on the deception, their the way they, they looked at each other, their non-evasive answers, their lies. Um, I felt there was something more going on. So I called Lieutenant Ball and had him grab a few detectives and come over to our location so we can figure out what was going on. Okay. Uh, and did Lieutenant Ball show up? He did. What did you do after that? He showed up with Detective Dave Stubbs. And at that time, we went and locked knocked on uh, apartment 175, which was Lori Vallow's residence. Okay. Did anyone answer? No, they didn't. What did you do next? We knocked on apartment 174 uh, because through our investigation, we knew that her niece, Melanie Boudreaux, lived right next to her, uh, and we didn't get an answer there either. Okay. What did you do after that? <clears throat> At that time, Lieutenant Ball instructed me to go to the prosecutor's office to obtain a search warrant for those residents while they stayed on scene to try to get a hold of Lori, Alex, or even Melanie Boudreaux. Why did you feel the need to get a warrant? At that time, we felt that 
there was something more going on with the whereabouts of JJ. And we weren't getting any cooperation from uh, Chad Daybell or Alex Cox at that time. Okay. Did you get a warrant that day? We did not. How come? On our way to the prosecutor's office, uh, Detective Hope, with the phone number that Chad provided, uh, called Lori, left her a message. She didn't answer her phone. Uh, and once we were at the prosecutor's office, Lori Vallow then returned the phone call from Detective Hope, and Detective Hope spoke with her on the phone. Okay. Uh, do you know what happened after that? He was able to convince Lori to open the door. She stated she was home, and there were detectives outside that wanted to speak with her. Are you aware if Detective Ball and Stubbs spoke with Lori Vallow that day? They did. Do you know if they had a, a body cam recording that conversation? They did. Have you seen that body cam? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, based on your collective investigation, what did you learn I learned that Lori Vallow had told Detective Hope. Correction. Objection, Your Honor. He's, he's going to go into hearsay evidence <coughs> saying what Detective Hope told I think Hope there needs her. to be some additional foundation in what he's going on. I didn't see a hearsay coming, but it seemed like a foundation issue to me. Okay. So, Detective Hermosillo, I asked if you were aware if there was a body cam uh, recording of that conversation? There was. And did you watch that body cam? I did. Did you speak uh, with Detective Ball and Stubbs about their encounter with Lori Vallow? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, is that a normal part of an investigation, to meet with other officers who are working the case? Absolutely. Okay. And is that something you regularly do in the course of an investigation? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, based on your conversation and your, the video, was there, what did you learn? Lori Vallow told the detectives Objection, Your Honor. This is hearsay. Because he's learning it from, well, I guess I'm not going to do a speaking objection, but if we want okay. to a sidebar, I can. I'm going to overrule that at this point. I haven't heard hearsay come out. Um, you can answer the question, officer. Your Honor, if I could, would the court allow me to elaborate a little bit? If you'd like to uh, you know, have additional voir dire on your objection, you can do that. Okay. Well, I don't have any additional voir dire. I, okay. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, are you basing your testimony on what somebody else, what you saw somebody else uh, converse with, with the other detectives or the other officers? I'm basing my testimony off what I saw on the video. Okay. Judge, it's hearsay. It's somebody else speaking, and he's speaking for that person. Let me have a brief sidebar with counsel. All right, the court had under advisement an objection made by the defense that the uh, question was eliciting an improper hearsay response. I am going to sustain that objection, so I'd ask you to ask a different question this time, Mr. Wood. Thank you. So, Detective uh, Hermosillo, you, you did testify that you did watch body cam. That's correct. Okay. Uh, based on what you saw, what were your, in that, what next steps did you take in your investigation? I contacted uh, Detective Pillar with the Gilbert Police Department because we were unable to locate or uh, substantiate where JJ was at that time. Um, it was late evening and we still hadn't heard where JJ was at that time. At that time, I had Detective Ryan Pillar get a hold of Melanie Gibb uh, to see if J.J. was with Melanie Gibb. 
and he was not with Melanie Gibb. So you were you were not that evening able to substantiate the location of JJ Vallow. That's correct. Okay. What did you do? Uh, what was the next step in your investigation? The next step was the next morning, November twenty seventh, twenty nineteen. We met at the prosecutor's office and obtained a search warrant for apartment 175, 174, and 107. And what was the address of those locations again? 565 Pioneer, Rock Creek, Townhomes. Okay. Were you able to obtain those search warrants? Yes, we were. And did you search those apartments? We did. Okay, can you walk us through that? Which apartment did you search first? We started with 175 first, which was Lori Vallow's apartment. Um, when we initially went into apartment 175, uh, they had to break down the front door, um, which was included in the search warrant. We went into apartment 175. There were uh, couches, dishes in the sink, uh, food in the pantry, food in the refrigerator. Um, upstairs there were beds, uh, toiletries, everything that looked like someone had lived there except for there were no clothes on the hangers. There were just empty hangers in all the closets. Um, and so that caught our attention as well. Did you, were, were any people in there when you entered? There was nobody in apartment 175, 174, and, and 107 was completely vacant. Okay. So you didn't locate JJ in apartment 175? No. Okay. Did you uh, find any evidence that JJ had been there? Yes, there were some there were some toys on the front step, little appeared to be little boy scooters, toys. Uh, there was a, a little boy suitcase uh, under the stairwell in apartment 175. Um, there was also a, an older prescription prescribed to JJ Vallo of Respiradone that we located. Um, but aside from that, there was there was nothing else. Okay. Um, was there anything else of interest that you found in apartment 175? <clears throat> there were uh, several guns. Uh, in the garage of 175, uh, several different army type knives. Objection, uh, relevance, Your Honor. Overruled. Um, several different empty magazines for for various weapons. Um, so there were there were things of that nature in the garage that caught our eye. Okay. Did you search any other buildings that, well, that was in apartment 175, correct? Correct. And then you searched apartment 174? Correct. And who did apartment 174 belong to? Melanie Boudreaux, who is Lori's niece. And did you find JJ there? No. Were any individuals present when you searched that apartment? There was not. Okay. And you may have already stated this. I'm sorry. Did you search apartment 107? We did. What did you find in apartment 107? It was completely vacant. Okay. Did you search any other buildings that day? We did. In apartment 175 in the master bedroom, uh, there was a rental agreement for a storage unit in Rexburg. Uh, and on that rental agreement had Lori Ryan as the tenant of the storage unit um, with the 
storage unit number being C52. Um, it gave the address self-storage on Airport Road in Rexburg. Um, so based on that information, we were able to obtain another search warrant for the storage unit. Okay, and what did you find there? In the storage unit, there were some children's bikes, uh, some winter clothing. Uh, there was a personalized blanket with photographs of J.J. and Ty Lee, Colby Ryan, uh, the defendant, Miss Vallow, uh, just family photographs that they kind of had sewn onto a blanket. Okay. Your Honor, I'm going to ask the witness be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 7A through 7K. The court has a copy. The court has a copy already. You have the originals. I will switch you. I think I have the originals and those are copies, I'm told by the clerks. Detective, can you take a minute and look through what's been marked as 7A through 7K and let me know when you're, you're finished. Are you familiar with State's Exhibit 7A through K? Yes, I am. Uh, what do those exhibits purport to be? Photographs of the exterior and interior of apartment 175. Okay. Were you there when those photos were taken? I was. Okay. Uh, are those photos true and accurate representations of what you witnessed in on the outside and inside of that apartment that day? Yes, they are. Uh, Your Honor, the state would move for the admission of State's Exhibit 7A through K into evidence. Any objection? May I have one here in aid? You may. So, Detective Hermosillo, uh, you indicate that these photographs were taken uh, during a search warrant? That's correct. And that search warrant was obtained on what date? November 27th, 2019. Okay. And that was, uh, what were you looking for? J.J. Vallo. Okay. And you believe that a crime was committed and that's why you busted down the door? Objection but relevance. Uh, we're outside of the scope of <clears throat> the foundation. If there's an objection for these photographs, how does it relate, Mr. Thomas? I'm going to object to photograph. Uh, under 7J, as I believe it's inflammatory and doesn't have any, uh, not within the scope of what they were looking for. Other than that, I won't object to any of the others. Okay. 
court's reviewed the photograph of 7J. Um, officer, were those items there when the warrant was uh, served? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The objections overruled, and the photographs 7A through 7K are all admitted into evidence at this time. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7A? That is the front door of apartment 175 facing westbound. Okay. And is that the apartment, to your, to your knowledge and investigation, that Lori Vallow was living in? That's correct. Okay. And is that the door you knocked on that morning? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I apologize. I didn't ask if I could publish these to the jury. Okay, they can be published. They're admitted. Detective, can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7B? That is the front room of apartment 175, uh, standing at the front door entry, looking towards the living room and the dining area. Okay. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7C? That's also the front room, uh, standing in the dining area, looking towards the front door and the stairwell going upstairs. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7D? So the photograph just before, there's a white little uh, door. If you'll give us just a moment, Council. We're going to dim the lights a little bit. So Thank you. Can be seen better. Thank you. <clears throat> can you put the, the previous photograph back on? Perfect. So just below the TV on the stairwell, there's a white little door that is a crawl space that goes under the stairs. Uh, the next photograph with the Star Wars suitcase, uh, that's where we located the Star Wars suitcase. Uh, there was also three or four or five preparedness bags with emergency kits uh, under the stairwell, and that's what the black and green bag is there next to the Star Wars suitcase. Okay. When you say a preparedness bag, what was in it? Oh, there was water, flares, uh, I believe there were MRE food, um, just like a 72-hour kit is the best way to describe it. Okay. Can you describe State's Exhibit 7E? That is a photograph standing at the top of the stairwell, uh, looking down towards the bottom floor. In States Exhibit 7F. <clears throat> this is a photograph of the master bedroom. Uh, the doorway to the right uh, leads down the hallway to two separate bedrooms. The doorway to the left is a doorway into the master bathroom and towards the closet area. Detective, I'm going to skip ahead to State's Exhibit 7H. Can you describe that, what, what you observed there? This is the master bedroom closet. This is what caught our attention. All the blank 
empty hangers hanging in the closet. There are no clothes. There's there's a towel hanging on the back door, but there are no clothes. Normally when people go on trips and plan to come home, they don't take all their belongings out of their closet. There's still some items that usually remain. And this caught our attention because there was nothing in that closet other than empty hangers. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7I and where that was located? This was a bedroom off the hallway to the north side. Uh, there were some of Alex Cox's belongings found in this bedroom. Okay. How did you know they were Alex Cox's? Um, it had his name on some of the items in a plastic tub in, in the closet. Okay. Can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 7J? That is also an Alex Cox room. Uh, there was a couple Tyvek suits that were also in the closet. Um, there's the plastic tub that, that I just described earlier that had uh, some of Alex's belongings inside that tub in the closet. Okay. Detective, can you describe what's been marked as State's Exhibit 7G? <clears throat> That's the rental agreement we located in Lori Vallow's master bedroom on the printer. Uh, it has Lori Vallow, correction, Lori Ryan on the left side is the tenant or the owner of that storage. Um, it also gives a phone number. What is that phone number? I, I can't see it from... Is there a way to zoom in on this? Hand the exhibit to the witness if he can. That's not very clear. Can you hand the witness? Thank you, sir. You want the phone number? Yes, what is that phone number? 480-692-9562. Yes, ma'am. And you stated that uh, the, uh, the contract was with a Lori Ryan? That's correct. Through your investigation, are you aware if Lori Vallow's name was ever Lori Ryan? Yes, it was. Uh, how do you know that? Uh, through our investigation, we learned she was married to Joe Ryan. And was that before she was married to Charles Vallow? That's correct. Okay, thank you. One moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 8A through Q. Mr. I believe I have the originals here from the clerk, so sorry to confuse, but we'll swap those copies. Your Honor, that the originals, I, I realize there's a sticker on both, but the originals were the ones handed to the detective, and that's the court's copy that the court has. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, Mr. Wood, then. Detective, can you look through State's Exhibit A through Q, and let me know when you're done.
Go ahead. Are you familiar with State's Exhibit A through Q? Yes, I am. Uh, what does what do those exhibits purport to be? These are items that were found in the garage of apartment 175. Okay. Are, are they photographs of those items? They are photographs. And is this the same garage that you testified to searching earlier? Yes, it is. Uh, in Exhibits 8A through Q, are those true and accurate representations of what you witnessed in that garage that day? Yes, they are. Your Honor, I'd ask the State's Exhibits A through Q be entered into evidence. Any objection? If I may avoid your judge. You may. Thank you. Um, exhibit A, is that how you, th these, these photographs are staged, so to speak. I mean, these, this is not how you found the garage, correct? Correct. Okay. And so were you involved in, and that's A through D are the ones that are in the garage, right? All of them are in the garage except for 8E and 8F. Everything else was photographed inside the garage. Okay. So E and F were not in the garage, correct? That photograph of 8E? Yes. Was not taken in the garage. That's correct. And 8F was not taken in the garage. That's correct. Okay. Um, and as I indicated earlier, these, these photographs were staged. They weren't just, this is not how you found the stuff, right? No, we, they were in uh, tubs and bags, and we emptied those tubs and bags out to get a better photograph of what was inside of them. Okay. I have no objection to the to the admission of these photographs. Okay. Exhibits A eight A through Q are all admitted and they can be published. Thank you. Detective, can you describe what you found in State's Exhibit 8A. Again, this is the garage of 175. There were some tubs, you can see in the background, the black tub and the plastic tub that contain these items. They were taken out of the tubs and laid out. Uh, what this photograph of is a picture of a ghillie suit, uh, several... Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop you. Can you describe what a ghillie suit is? A ghillie suit is something that you wear if, if you want to camouflage yourself. If you're laying out in a field, you put that over the top of you to blend in with the brush or whatever the environment is. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wood, could we get a spelling on that for the record? If the detective knows. <laughs> uh, I don't. <laughs> okay. Your Honor, I believe it's G-H-I-L-L-I, -I, but I could be incorrect. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Detective. <clears throat> uh, several different magazines um, used to hold ammunition, different caliber of guns. Uh, there's also two suppressors or, or silencers. Uh, that you use to put on the end of a gun to keep it quiet when it's fired. Um, so that's what is laid out on the ground there. Okay, thank you. Can you describe what was found in State's Exhibit 8B? There were a couple black trash bags you can see in the photograph. Uh, they were full of clothing, 
uh, some miscellaneous papers inside the bags. So we lit, we emptied the bags out and laid out the clothing uh, on the garage floor and took a photograph of it. Can you describe what you found in 8C? This was also in a tub, um, several rounds of ammunition, different uh, caliber of weapons, uh, just uh, a lot of ammunition in, in that specific tub. You describe 8D, what you found in 8D. 8D was a rifle uh, that we had found on the garage floor or in the garage. Um, the thing that caught our eye with the rifle was the end of the rifle is threaded for a silencer or a suppressor. Uh, so that was also photographed. And this... This may seem like a silly question, but when you say the end of the rifle, uh, what portion of the rifle are you talking about? The barrel. Okay. What were you observing in State's Exhibit 8E? So the black rifle was the same one from the previous photograph, just taken, laid down at the police department on a table. There was also uh, another rifle inside of that bag, um, and that's the rifle you see above the black rifle. Okay. It's State's Exhibit 8F. That was the other rifle inside of that bag. Can you describe what you see in State's Exhibit 8G or what you observed? Those were the two silencers or suppressors that we had located inside the garage. Okay. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8H? Those were uh, knives that were also located uh, in the vicinity of the rifles as well. Okay. <clears throat> State's Exhibit 8I. That was also a handgun loaded inside the, located inside the garage, um, in a tub just off to the right of where it's sitting. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8J? That was a, I don't, a, a Halloween mask, it looks like. Um, that was kind of on top of a plastic bag, a plastic Walmart bag that's in the next photo. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8K? So the, the Halloween mask was on top of this bag, and it had rope and duct tape inside that bag. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8L? That is Alex Cox's passport. That was located inside the garage. Okay. Was that passport still active to your knowledge? It was. Okay. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 8M? <clears throat> so these were documents. Uh, that we had located amongst uh, the defendant Vallow's belongings or what we assumed were her belongings inside the garage. Um, okay. 
were any of those documents an email? They were it. They were emailed from in the upper left corner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Email from Chad Daybell. Okay. Eight and what did you observe? <clears throat> Those are some more of the documents from Chad Daybell. Is it fair to say that these documents were laid out and then pictures taken, subsequent pictures taken in a row? Correct. They weren't found that way. Yeah. States Exhibit 8O. More of the same document. What what did you find on States Exhibit 8P? Those books were with the documents in the garage that were appeared to be written by Chad Daybell. Okay. And finally, States Exhibit 8Q. That was a cell phone that was also located in the garage. Eight P. testified of the search of this apartment and the garage. Uh, what was the next step in your investigation? The next step, uh, we contacted the FBI. Um, we were just trying to get a hold of of the defendant, Vallo, and Chad. We were trying to locate the children. Um, in speaking with family members, we spoke with uh, Colby Ryan, who was Lori's son. Uh, and at that time, he also stated that he hadn't spoken with his sister for a while. Um, and so our search of JJ also started to encompass Tylee Ryan as well. Did you ever try to contact Chad Daybell or Lori Vallow? We did several times, but their phones were shut off. Okay. At this time, were you aware of their location? Not at that time, no. Okay. And, and just to clarify, I'm speaking in the, the period shortly after the November search of the home. Yes, at that time, we didn't know where they were at. Okay. Uh, did you reach out to anyone else? Did you, let me rephrase that, did you contact family and friends? Yeah, we, we contacted uh, Colby Ryan, uh, contacted Lori's niece, Melanie Boudreau. Um, we would, we were contacting anybody that would listen to us or, or take our calls, trying to find the whereabouts of the kids. Okay. During this time, did Lori Vallow ever call the Rexburg police to report missing children? No, she did. Okay. Detective, if I say Nick Mick, do you know what that means? Yes, sir. What is that? It's an acronym for National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Did you contact them? We did. December 11th, we contacted Nick Mick and entered J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan as missing and endangered children. Okay. Did you ever alert the public that there was a search for J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? 
Yes. When was that? Uh, that was December 20th, 2019. Uh, the police department gave a press release and tried to get those names out in public to assist us uh, in any way we can, in, in any way they could. Um, we also set up a tip hotline through NICMIC, through the FBI, and the Rexburg Police Department, so people with any tips or, or possible sightings of Tylee or JJ could call in, give us some information, and we would have officers or detectives follow up on each tip that came in. Okay. Did any of those tips lead to the location of JJ Vallow or Tylee Ryan? No, they did not. Okay. Your Honor, if we could have a brief sidebar. <laughs> yes. May I continue? You may. <clears throat> Detective, are you aware, <clears throat> excuse me, if there was ever a child protection action filed regarding J.J. Vallow and Tylee, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Yes, there was. What county was that filed in? Because we're going to object based on 404B. We previously... Uh, objected on this, and I know the court's ruled on that, but we just like that put on the record. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, this does delve into some 404B issues, which were previously determined by the court in a ruling that was stated on the record on February 22nd, 2023. <coughs> and for the reasons I would incorporate into that uh, finding today, also incorporating the findings in that record, I'll overrule the objection, and you can continue this line of questioning, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Were you in, uh, what county was that filed in? Uh, Madison, I believe. Okay. Were you involved? Yes, I was. How so? I was the one who wrote the affidavit. Okay. Um, are you aware if Lori Vallow was ever ordered to produce her children to the Rexburg police? Yes, she was. Okay. Are you aware if she ever produced her children to the Rexburg police? She did not. Okay. Detective, through your investigation, were you ever able to locate the whereabouts of Lori Vallow and Chad Dayville? Yes, we were. How did you do that? Through cell phone data, uh, tips coming in through the hotline that we had set up. Um, we were we were able to determine that they were in Kauai. Okay, Kauai is in the island of Hawaii. Correct. Okay, or one of the islands in Hawaii. Uh, did you go to Kauai? I did. Uh, why did you go there? We went there to assist the Kauai Police Department uh, with the service of that court order. Okay. Uh, and do you know if she was served with that order? She was. Do you know what date? She was served on January 25th, 2020. Okay. Did you do anything else while you were there? We did. Uh, we also assisted... Kauai Police Department with the search warrant of Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow's rental vehicle, as well as their uh, condo they were renting in Princeville. Okay, and, and to clarify, did you perform those searches? No, I did not. Who performed those searches? Kauai Police Department. Okay. Were you present uh, when their condominium was searched? I was, yes. Okay. Um, and did you go in after the search was performed? Yes, I did. Okay. <clears throat> did you find J.J. Vallow 
in that condominium? No, sir. Did you find Tyree Ryan? No. What did you observe in that condominium? Uh, normal furniture, uh, clothes, beds. Uh, just appeared that two uh, adult people were living there. Okay. And did you find any children's toys? No. Did you observe any children's medication? No. Uh, did you observe any children's clothes? No. Any teenage girl clothes? No. Nope. Okay. Did you see anything that would indicate that minor children had lived there? No. Or, excuse me, had been living there? No. You stated that uh, the rental car that Chad and Lori Daybell were using was searched as well? That's correct. Did you observe that search? I did. Okay. Um, did you aid in that search? No, sir. Okay, just observed it? Correct. Detective, I'm going to talk to you about the concept of proof of life. If I use the words proof of life, what does that mean? Any documentation that would be able to confirm if somebody was still alive. Okay. Um, did you ever, pursuant to your investigation, find a proof of, well, let me rephrase that. Pursuant to your investigation, what was the last date you are aware of, of proof of life for Tylee Ryan? September 8th, 2019. And what was that proof of life? It was a photograph taken in West Yellowstone. Okay. Um, and were you able to identify who Tylee Ryan was in that photograph? Yes. Pursuant to your investigation, what was the last date you were aware of proof of life for J.J. Vallow? September 22nd, 2019. Okay. Uh, what was that proof of life? It was a photograph taken of J.J. <clears throat> excuse me, on sitting on a couch. Okay. In Defendant Vallow's front room. All right. Your Honor, may I suggest this would be a good time for the mid-morning break? That's fine. We can go ahead and take our mid-morning break then. We will go for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will resume again uh, until the lunch break. I would remind the people in attendance here, please take your personal effects with you and don't leave any bags or other items on the tables when you go. So we'll be in recess. All right, please. Okay, we will go back on the record on case CR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Just finished our mid-morning break. Uh, we'll have the jurors return and you can continue your direct examination, Mr. Wood, of this witness.
rise, please. All right, thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> okay, I'll remind the witness you're still under oath, and Mr. Wood, you can continue your direct examination. Thank you. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as States Exhibit A through D. Is there a number corresponding? I, I apologize. States Exhibit 9A through 9D. Thank you. Detective, can you look over those and let me know when you've had a chance to review them? Okay. Do you recognize States Exhibit 9A through D? Yes, I do. What, do, what does that exhibit <clears throat> purport to be? This is the 2018 Jeep Wrangler that I seized on November 4th, 2019. Okay. And are those images true and accurate representations of what you witnessed uh, with that Jeep? Yes, sir. Your Honor, I'd ask that States Exhibit 9A through D be entered into evidence. Any objection? <laughs> you may. Thank you. Uh, these photographs, were they taken uh, at a police station or somewhere, or were these taken at, uh, where, where were they taken? They were taken in our impound bay at, at the police department. Okay. And the red evidence tape that was put on at the police station when you got there? That's correct. Okay. How did it get to the police station? It was towed. Towed? Okay. And where was it taken from? 565 Pioneer, just outside of the garage of 175. Okay. Thank you. No, no uh, objection, Judge. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So exhibits 9A through D are all admitted to evidence and may be published. Thank you. Detective, you testified about this Jeep earlier, so I realize we're going back a little bit. Can you describe what's shown in States Exhibit 9A? That is a, a photograph of the Jeep that I had seized, like I said earlier, from the to view of the passenger side of the Jeep. Okay. Nine B. Uh, that's the rear view of the Jeep with uh, Texas plates that we were told about by Gilbert. Okay. States Exhibit 9C. That's a photograph of the inside of the Jeep taken from the driver's door. And 9E. It's also a Photograph of the inside of the Jeep from the passenger side. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be shown states exhibits 8N and 
Sorry, I'm not speaking into the microphone. I'd ask that the witness be shown states exhibits 8M and 8N again. All right, we'll have the bailiff deliver those to the witness. Detective, uh, you testified earlier about these documents that they were found in the garage of apartment 175, correct? That's correct. And that one of those doc, at least one of those documents is an email? That's correct. I asked you earlier who the email was from. Uh, can, can you read the email address that that document is sent from? Judge, I would object here. I would, I would ask the court to uh, take the, uh, the exhibit as it is, and um, the best evidence is the exhibit itself, not what, what can be read or what can't be read. In honesty, I can't read it, and I don't think, I don't know. I, don't I just understand. don't think it's appropriate to have him read. Okay, I don't understand the objection. There's a photograph that's been admitted, uh, as I understand, through uh, prior offering, and it's in evidence. So to the extent the witness wants to address what's on the photograph, it's permitted. Um, I don't know how hard it is to read or not. I don't have it in front of me. To me, it looks like chaddaybill at gmail.com. Okay, thank you. Detective, we had talked about, before the break, proof of life. And you spoke about some photos. Your Honor, I'd ask that uh, this, the witness be handed States Exhibit 29A and States Exhibits 13 and 14. Detective, before I ask any questions about that, I'm going to ask a few questions. Are you familiar with an iCloud account, Lori for Style at iCloud.com? Yes, I am. Is this uh, an account that you have reviewed in the course of your investigation? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, Detective, can you look at Exhibit 29A? What does that pr document purport to be? It's a business certification record of the custodian of records of an Apple account. Okay. Does it list the Apple account on that document? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. Does it state anywhere on that document if the record was made at or near the time 
or from information transmitted by someone with knowledge of that document. Yes, sir. Okay. Does it state anywhere if that document, if if those documents were kept in the regular uh, course of the business? Yes, it does. Okay. How does it state that making those records was a regular practice of that business or of that activity? Yes. Okay. Is this document sw um, excuse me, signed under penalty of perjury? Yes, it is. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask that States Exhibit 29A and the accompanying records be allowed into evidence. 29A is an exhibit. When you say the accompanying records, are you talking about uh, exhibit 14? Uh, 13 and 14, Your Honor. Okay. Which I can lay further foundation for. Well, let's start there with exhibit 29A. Is there any objection to exhibit 29A being introduced? Uh, there is, Your Honor. What's the objection? May I have voir dire and aid of objection? You may. Okay. Who, whose signature is on the, the document there? Catherine Calvert. And is it an actual signature or is it an a e signature? An e signature. Okay, so it's not her actual signature. Doesn't appear to be. No. Okay. Uh, have you talked to Catherine Calvert? I have not. No. In the course of your investigation, did you have an opportunity to contact anyone at Apple? I've spoken with people at Apple throughout the course of the investigation. Yes. Who? Off the top of my head, I don't, I don't have a name. Not in reference to Catherine Calvert, though. Your Honor, I'm going to ask for a sidebar. All right. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Upon uh, discussing with counsel at sidebar, let me ask from the defense, is there any objection at this point to the admissions of Exhibit 29A and States 13 and 14? Uh, I don't have a copy of 13 and 14, but 29A is the business record, is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't have an objection to that. Okay, we'll start there then. Exhibit 29A is admitted into evidence, and you can continue your inquiry, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Detective Hermosillo, through the course of your investigation, have you reviewed the iCloud account Lori for style at iCloud.com. Yes, I have. Uh, from reviewing that account, are you able to tell who it belongs to? Yes. Who did it belong to? Lori Vallow. How did you know that? Based on the records on the account. Okay. And the, the photographs and everything attached to it. Okay. Detective, can you look at State's Exhibit? I believe it was 13 and 14. Do you recognize those documents? I do. What do they purport to be? Photographs of JJ, Tylee, and Alex in Yellowstone. Also a photograph of J.J. Uh, sitting on a couch in red pajamas. Okay. And did you observe those photographs in that iCloud account? Yes, I did. And are those true and accurate representations of the photographs found in the iCloud account, in the Lori for Style iCloud account? Yes, they are. Your Honor, I'd move for admission of States Exhibits 13 and 14. Um, I'll take them up one at a time on Exhibit 13. Is there any objection? 13 is which one? The uh, Yellowstone photo? Yes. No objection. 
Exhibit 13 is admitted, uh, and Exhibit 14 is a photo of a uh, child on a couch. No objection. All right, Exhibit 14 is also admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. May I publish those to the jury? <clears throat> yes. <coughs> Mr. Thomas, you were able to see these courtesy copies before we published them, correct? Prior to publication, yes. Okay, thank you. You can publish them, Mr. Wood, if you'd like. Detective, uh, what do you observe in State's Exhibit 13? It's the photograph of J.J., Tylee, and Alex in Yellowstone. How do you know that's Yellowstone? I've, I've been there before. I recognize it. Okay. Detective, was there metadata associated with that photo? There was. Did it have a date? September 8th, 2019. Is that the same photo you referred to earlier when we were discussing proof of life? That's correct. Detective, what do you observe in States Exhibit 14? The picture of J.J. Vallow in red pajamas on the couch. Okay. Uh, is that the same picture we were speaking about earlier when we spoke about proof of life? Yes, sir. Does that picture have metadata with it? It does. Uh, what was the date on that picture? September twenty second, 2019. Thank you. And perhaps I should have asked, uh, what is metadata? It's just information uh, associated with the picture, date, time. Things like that. So, Detective, at this point, we've, sp we've spoken about your search for JJ and Tylee. Uh, did any part of your investigation uh, include working with Fremont County? It did. Uh, did any part of your investigation involve Tammy Daybell? It did. Okay. Uh, as part of your investigation, did you learn that Tammy Daybell had died? Yes, I did. Do you know when she died? October 19th, 2019. Okay. And did you learn of any other incident regarding Tammy? Yes. What was that? Uh, she, that she was possibly shot at on October 9th, 2019, outside of their residence. Okay. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you help execute a search warrant on the Daybell residence? Yes, I did. When was that? June 9th, 2020. Uh, what is the address of that residence? 202 North, 1900 East, Fremont County. Okay. Now, just for clarification, it, what city is that listed in? <clears throat> it's listed in, in Rexburg. Okay. Um, but it's in Fremont County. Okay, because Rexburg is normally... In Madison County. Correct. Correct. Okay. As you executed that search warrant on June 9th, uh, what was the first thing you did? On June 9th, we got to Chad Daybell's residence at approximately 7 in the morning. Uh, we went and made contact, knocked on the front door. Uh, Chad Daybell's son, Mark Daybell, answered the door. He had a bowl of cereal in his hand. He was eating cereal. It was early in the morning. Um, and we informed Mark why we were there uh, and that we needed to speak with Chad Daybell. Okay. Uh, then what happened? Mark told us that his dad, Chad, was still asleep. Uh, 
and directed us to Chad's room, uh, which is a, it's like a loft room that was above the garage area. So we walked us through the house and to the stairwell of Chad's room. Okay. Uh, and what did you observe then? We walked up the stairwell, announced ourselves. Uh, Chad was still asleep in bed as we came around the little half wall. Uh, Chad sat up. Uh, we told Chad why we were there, that we had a search warrant, search the property and the residence. Uh, he asked if he can get dressed and get some clothes on. We allowed him to do that. And then he walked back downstairs with us into the kitchen area. Okay. Um, what happened then? Chad asked to contact his attorney, and at that time it was Mark Means. Uh, Chad was allowed to contact his attorney. Uh, he spoke on the phone with his attorney in the kitchen area. Um, his attorney asked to speak with one of our detectives, but was referred to speak with the prosecutor at that time. Okay. What happened after that? After that, we went into the front room where Chad was given a copy of the search warrant. Uh, he sat in the recliner closest to the door. Uh, he reviewed the search warrant. His children at that time were sitting on the couch across from him. Um, he asked if he needed to leave or his children needed to leave, and we explained to them they didn't need to leave. They were free to stay, but if they stayed, they would be accompanied by an officer for safety reasons. Um, at that point, his children stated they were going to go, and Chad stated he didn't know whether he was going to go or not, um, but asked to go make a phone call out in his vehicle that was parked in the driveway. Okay. <coughs> uh, what did you do then? At that time, the children were allowed to leave. Uh, we walked outside in the front yard area. Uh, Chad got into the uh, driver's seat of a vehicle that was backed into the driveway. He was on the phone talking. Uh, in the meantime, there were the FBI ERT team, the evidence recovery team, arrived on scene along with other detectives now that the scene was safe to arrive. Um, and they began marking off different areas in the backyard, uh, just setting up for the search warrant and what we needed to do that day. Okay. Who, who aided, <clears throat> who was a part of serving that search warrant that day in terms of law enforcement? The FBI, uh, the FBI evidence re recovery team, Fremont County Sheriff's Office, Rexburg Police Department, the Idaho Attorney General's Office. Uh, I believe that was it. And did you assist in the actual search that day? Yes, I did. Okay. You spoke about Mr. Daybell or Chad Daybell sitting in a vehicle in his driveway, correct? Correct. Were you able, did you observe him, uh, were you able to observe his behavior during that time? I was. Uh, Mr. Daybill was sitting in the driver's side facing west. Um, he was on the phone. And while he was on the phone, he had the phone in his right hand. He was intently looking over his right shoulder. Um, he would talk for a second, look back over his right shoulder watching what was going on behind him to his left, to his right, excuse me. So we positioned ourselves to see exactly what Mr. Daybell was concerned or, or looking at. Uh, and when we positioned ourselves that way, we could see Mr. Daybell uh, 
You know, I'm going to object. This, this, is, this is information that's calling for speculation, and he's speculating about what Mr. Daybell was seeing at the time. Your Honor, I'm going to, I can ask some more questions. All right. The objection is sustained, but nothing to strike on the response yet. If you'll ask another question, Mr. Williams. <clears throat> at any time, did you uh, go stand by where Mr. Daybell was sitting? We did. Okay. Uh, did you speak with him at all? We did. Uh, what did you say to him? I asked Mr. Debill if he needed a coat. Because um, at that time he was getting out of the vehicle. Okay. Uh, you testified that he had been looking over his shoulder. Correct. Uh, and that you perceived he was looking in a specific direction. Correct. When you went and stood by where Mr. Debill was... Did you look in the direction that it appeared he had been looking in? I did. What did you observe when you looked in that direction? I observed the tree and the pond area on that side of the property. Okay. After that... Uh, what did you do to aid in the search of Chad Daybell's property? We were given certain tasks by the head of the FBI ERT uh, to do different things. There were multiple people there. Um, so at that point, my original task was to sift through the fire pit that was located on the property. And what was the purpose of that? To see if there were there was anything of evidentiary value in the fire pit. Okay. You spoke about a pond area. Did you observe any activity activity uh, by the search team in the pond area that day? Yes, I did. When did that start? Wait. Time wise. Yes. Roughly 9 o'clock, maybe, Okay. in the morning. And what did you observe? While we were sifting through uh, the fire pit, uh, 